Hello everyone and welcome to Fire on Forte and welcome Nicola Murphy who's joining us from London today. Hello Nikki. Hello, where it's raining for anyone watching. Where it's raining but you know you've got a cup of tea you've already told me so you're probably staying nice and cosy for as long as possible in the office I take it. 100% yeah I'm in uh, River HQ which is Hyde Park. Very nice. Now, calling in from London seems to be very on topic because to introduce Nicola to the audience, Nicola is the founder of a group of marketing agencies, the River Group. So the River Group has been in business for nearly 30 years, publishing magazines and managing and leading and creating fantastic digital content of which there is a stream of awards for all of the content that has been produced by River over the years. And I've seen some even this week, so congratulations. Thank you. Not, not only the content side of things, Nikki and her team has, have also founded sister agencies. So Maven Comms is a PR agency that is part of River Group. And I just think this is so incredible that post-COVID, Nicola and her team created Reflect, which is the UK's first inclusion and diversity-led influencer group, which is the first of its kind, clearly, and I would love to know more about that. Congratulations of just such a varied group of businesses and yet also so integrated in the sense of you're working with customers and clients to create amazing communications. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, as most people say on these things, but it happens to be true. It's really not me. It's the team. We've got an amazing team. In fact, River was set up nearly 29 years ago. God, I'm so old. I do moisturize folks. Um, <laughs> and I've still got my first two colleagues that I employed all those years ago, Phil, who's our creative director and Wendy who's our group chief sub. So, and about 20% of the workforce have been here for 10 years or more, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, we've obviously got lots of new people, particularly around digital and social media, but yeah, three businesses, River is Integrated Marketing Services. So we work for UK, European and global businesses like Superdrug, that's one of our longest standing clients, 20 years, Holland and Barrett, 27 years, amazing. Thanks guys, if you're watching for your loyalty and your business. We have a TV studio, podcast studio, photographic studio, and we do through the line comms. Uh, about 90% is digital. We have Maven, which is PR agency, and we're in the do good thing space. So most of the work that Lisa, who's the managing director and her team do, is around health, well-being, and beauty. And then we have Reflect, which you mentioned, which is unique in that it's a not-for-profit it's a community interest company so all of the money um, that reflect makes by finding and managing the careers of diverse talent whether that be people of color lgbtq disability neurodiversity facial difference body dysmorphia whatever it is uh, goes into social immobility so we uh, when we make profits we find people from socially immobile backgrounds that could be returning mums or it could be um, young or late teenagers uh, who want to be in the media industry want to be agency side learn to be videographers journalists designers whatever it is and we bring them in so I always say when I'm interviewed you know I start singing circle of life at this point but the the point is that we will make media and marketing campaigns for brands that are more diverse because they are made by a group of people who are more diverse is the idea so so yeah that that's the agencies I have other I have the businesses outside of that but the agencies is where I spend most of my time Right. I mean, we're going to have to come back to other businesses. There's enough to talk about in, in the introduction there, isn't there? The, the Reflect Agency is really interesting. I'm so fascinated by that model. If you don't see it, it's really hard to obviously feel included. But the best way to do that is actually to create for people that know that experience, have the lived experience. And I saw something that you tweeted about leg a Lego figure um, and how a child who'd been born without a limb had actually written to Lego and Lego had created that item. And I thought that was a really, really good example of the importance of brands, like you I say, to reflect this. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's the problem with communicating on Zoom and Teams, isn't it? You've got oh, loads to say and then you speak over people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Lego... Uh, pretty good at uh, the, the whole DNI thing and they really do 
realize that that part of their brand world is including the people that buy their products I mean who would think it right but absolutely and, and some brands don't think like that and they do organization common to all all three agencies is super drug actually and I think they really nail the D and I think particularly around LGBTQ and their huge support of pride but equally you know if you look at all the research that we did when we set up reflect and and research generally it says that consumers particularly younger consumers uh gen z and gen a now um really do want to buy into brands that are doing good things that are caring about the community or the environment or the planet and that are being more truly inclusive they want to follow and buy into brands that have purpose and that's that was really where reflect came from and in fact it it totally wasn't my idea we like most companies we had lots of well-being days over covid all on teams and zooms like zoom zoom like this and um you know i think we all got fed up with lying on the floor in our kitchens doing yoga and hitting our head on the kitchen table and stuff like that so we decided to do a virtual dragon's den and we we had 10 teams of 10 people um we won quite a lot of business over covid we had a good covid so we mixed up the people that had been here for years with the new people and we the, the task was look at media and marketing and see what's missing and as an independently owned we all set it up if there's an idea that's good enough and there were some fantastic ideas there were some not fantastic ideas um and we shortlisted three and the river directors river group directors and also five of our clients were actually the judges uh, all run online as it were and, and we decided that reflect was the winner and we decided to set it up as a community interest company because as a group of directors we kind of really believed in it and felt that it was wrong to make money out of it to be honest because it's the right thing to do so yeah we are. Not, a, not a bad activity to do during pandemic as well. What a great idea. Because actually you want to get out of your own head when you're in the pandemic and you're in lockdown. And what a good idea to actually tap back into your creative juices to actually try and think of an idea for Dragon's Den and then to come up with something like this. And the fact that you guys acted on this, I think that's a really good message to other business owners. Because actually when your employees can be involved in building something, what's incredibly engaging and rewarding feeling isn't it yeah and we said to all of the the people in the teams all the colleagues you know if we whatever the winning one is if you want to be involved in it afterwards as kind of a shadow board um then you can be and uh james he won't mind me mentioning one of my colleagues here at river he runs our data and insights department really inspiring guy he actually has a disability with one of his hands and he said to me, you know, I'd really like to be involved because I truly feel included that it doesn't matter at River that I am a bit different. That's my difference. And I feel like I can express it. And he's been on the journey with Reflect for the entire way through. And actually, we've got a really inspiring and amazing because they do it for free group of shadow board members, some of whom are ex colleagues, but also some who are celebrities or successful business people. So one of our shadow, we, there are nine of them. One of our shadow board is Katie Piper, who famously is a, an acid attack victim. I've, Katie's a personal friend. I've been a trustee of KPF for God, almost nine years now, a long time. And she, she said something that resonated with what you said at the top of the call, Hannah, which is, and, and these are her words you can't be what you can't see and after she was injured and, and was recovering for two years at home and didn't go out so think about how how we were in COVID and, and she also had a catastrophic injury to cope with you know she said her aspiration as a as a young girl was to be on TV um, and yet when her face was literally taken away from her she didn't know whether that would actually become a reality because there weren't people that looked like her now on telly and now of course there are and she's been incredibly successful and she's really spearheaded that movement we've also got people like Stephen Robertson so Stephen was the chief executive of the big issue he's now been retired because of disability because in COVID um, he borrowed one of his two daughters skateboards on your hour that you were allowed to go out if you remember um, and he was skateboarding down the road and he fell off like you would do if you were a middle-aged person, just like I am, not been skateboarding since you were 14. And he hit his head on the curb and had a bit of concussion, went to hospital. They checked him over and they said, you know, we're 99% sure you're okay, but you really must stay for a brain scan 
because we can never be sure. We can't see what's going on inside your skull, of course. And he didn't because he felt okay. And he went home. He had dinner with his wife and his two daughters, just a normal evening, went to bed. And in the middle of the night, he had a fit. And of course, he had a bleed on the brain. He was put into an induced coma for three months. And then he was in a brain injury unit for a year, learning to walk and talk all over again. And Stephen and Katie and the other members of the shadow board, they really are people that have got lived experience of um, the influencers that we're seeking and those that we've already found and trying to get into advertising and marketing campaigns and mainstream media so that ultimately people that are, are that bit different and we're all different right we've all got our individual dna that might look different or feel different or think differently can see others like them in mainstream media whether that's tv magazines social media since we've all got you know our phones in our pockets all the time yeah, thank you for sharing those, because I think for the overall well-being of us as a society to actually understand other people's experiences as well, and that these really tragic things happen and how we all support everyone to go through that and then all accept everyone as this society, because actually you never know what can happen. You know, the guy who fell off the skateboard, you just don't know. This stuff happens to everyone. So um, the work that you're doing is so important and it's also just very, very clever as well, isn't it? So I hope that you can bring that model to all around the world. Um, Let's hope so. Let's hope so. I don't think there's another... There are DNI agencies, but they tend to only a couple, but they tend to focus on one vertical. So they might represent disabled people or people of color. But there, there isn't another that I know of that is um, a community interest company. And I'm really pleased about that. It's the right thing to do. So business owners out there, you know, come on, put your money where your mouth is. That's what we've done. It's there we important, go. important yep. stuff. I mean, the other thing I would say to you, Hannah, and I know Fire and Forte is all about entrepreneurial women, is, you know, each of the agencies is run by a woman. So I'm group chief exec. I, I don't really do anything. I'm more director of lunch. You know, I spend a lot of time with clients strategically. That's my background marketing. I started in FMCG and, you know, a bit of time entertaining, chatting. But each business is run by a very strong, very talented lady. So Jackie Garford is our group managing director, but she's MD of the biggest agency, River, and she's actually been here with me for nearly 18 years, which is fantastic. Thanks, Jackie, if you're watching this. And then we've got Lisa, who runs, which is four years now. We set it up just before the pandemic. Um, Brilliant timing. October 2019, and then Reflect, which we set up which is still really in startup mode. We've only been going a year, but that's also run by another Jackie Blake. Uh, and they're all, you know, they're all fantastic at the top of their game and all of a similar age to me. So don't give up, ladies, when you're in your 50s. There's so just because such good role models. But let's talk specifically about you because you're clearly a very strong and humble leader to say that you're now the director of lunch and the on the strategic side. To get to where you are today is phenomenal. And whenever I meet a business founder, I have to stop myself and realize that I assume that they were always made for this and that they may be made a big few jumps and led into this business. But actually, there's a real person behind the story who is actually quite surprised themselves where they are. What's your story? Did you always dream of having your own business? Oh, God, no, absolutely not. <laughs> it was, I mean, it's fantastic. You know, it's wonderful. And my therapist, yes, I've been to therapy, children, said to me that I created the family I didn't have in setting up businesses. And I think that's true. And every on- entrepreneur that I know, and a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs, and a lot of them are female entrepreneurs, have kind of are seeking something in their work-life balance that they didn't have when they were growing up. And therefore, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, men and women, actually, that, you know, there's a purpose behind it that isn't just money. I mean, the money's nice, but you can be miserable just as much with money as you can without money, sometimes more miserable because everybody thinks when they make it, it's going to make them happy. And it's it's simply not true. Happiness is not a default setting. You heard it here first, you know. And, and now I've forgotten the question, Hannah, because I am menopausal, which is all over the news, right? Well, ask me again. But that's such a good point, though, The that money doesn't buy you happiness. So be sure that you're responsible for your own happiness. How did you get from, where did your career go from? Ah, there we go. There's the question. And how so you I began started. to found your own business. Yeah. So I did, um, my first degree was English language and literature. I was a bit lazy, like reading books. I got a tutu. 
uh, a drinkers and sportsmen's degree, as my lecturer sadly told me as he presented it to me on the dais. And then I went into sales at PNG, which I did for a few years. I loved it actually. Zipping around the country, you got a, you got a company car. I could I learned to drive at seventeen, but we couldn't afford for me to have a car, so I was chuffed about that and that's one of the reasons I took the job so I could be mobile uh, and then I went into marketing for the last couple of years I was there for six years and, and then I left and joined a small contract publisher so a magazine company in the days when branded content really was the poor boy to you know Vogue Red etc whereas I think these days it's completely turned on its head and it's more important and I was in that business as marketing and sales director for about three and a half years and ended up running the company and then left, took a couple of clients and set up River and the rest is history. So that was when I was in my late 20s. Um, it was a very successful start, though. Getting into P&G isn't easy, especially in the UK. It's incredibly competitive. So was it a difficult round of interviews and how you actually ended up getting in there, first of all? Do you know what? It really wasn't. And I don't mean that in a blase way. It was the milk round at university. And I've got a lot of children. I've got six kids. And most of them are in that, you know, they're a bit older than that now. The, the youngest is 23. But the whole kind of what am I going to do with my life thing? And I had no idea. I knew I needed a job, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it, we had a milk round thing, you know, when they put over the sports hall at university to lots of trestle tables and earnest looking people trying to persuade you to go and work for their company and Mars and Cadbury's and Unilever and P&G were just some of the people that were there. And I happened to get on particularly well with the sales director at P&G who had come that day to try and persuade people to come and, and work at Procter & Gamble. And I was always quite loud. My dear departed mum said, you know, I, I had an excess of personality from an early age. So I think uh, they were looking for salespeople who were confident. And I was quite confident. So that, so I got my job in sales. I don't think I would have started in marketing. I probably wasn't clever enough. But then having learned how to sell, which is really, you know, marketing without the colouring in, I then moved into into marketing and, and I've loved it ever since. I mean, marketing is endlessly interesting, creative. What was some of the first things that you really enjoyed doing that really sparked you up? Can you remember some of those first projects or clients? Well, I remember when we set up, there were two of us, a, a lady that I worked with at my previous business who was on the editorial side. So it was two women who set up and then there was an advertising company that sold into branded content that we went, that we kind of got into bed with, as it were. So there were four of us, two guys and two girls, and we had no money. And we, we rented this tiny little below ground, so basement office in Greek Street. And we thought we'd made it in Soho. We didn't have any, any clients really. Um, and we bought, in the days of terribly on PC advertising, there was an advert for milk tray so for Cadbury's and it had a, a very strapping chap all dressed in black with a rope round his shoulders a milk tray man and he used to I said it was on PC he used to shin up his lady loves balcony and leave her a box of milk tray with a little card on it with a silhouette of him and the tagline was and all because the lady loves milk tray uh, and we all, all used to get a bit of a flutter about that so we decided that we would do something similar so we spent the only money we had we weren't paying ourselves on 60 boxes of milk tray and my business partner her boyfriend now husband was a very good looking actor so we dressed him up as the milk tray man and he and I got into my little MR2 red MR2 I remember and we zipped all around the country delivering these boxes of milk tray and on the reverse of the card it said the front said announcing the launch of River Publishing that's what we were called in those days and on the back it said you're invited to lunch at the restaurant of your choice with my phone number on it and we managed to black we got thrown out of a few places thank you Barclay card head office in Northampton <laughs> by security but we did, we did manage the actor and I Toby to blag our way into the boardroom at Asda House in Leeds and Archie Norman who thank you Archie who was the chief executive at the time thought this was fantastic and a week later he rang me up and he said you know what I can't get that stunt um, out of my head we actually have a magazine and it's the biggest retail magazine in the industry do you fancy pitching for it and we were like oh no we're far too busy oh go on then and that ended up being our, our first big contract and you know Archie is, Archie's a very inspiring chap thanks Archie and that's how we started and pretty soon we were working well actually I must mention Keith so Keith Gold was the marketing director of IBM and he had a marketing budget and he said 
don't borrow money if you're setting up a business. I'll give you my magazine budget in exchange for you producing my magazines for a year. And that was how we started. And actually, I got remarried a few years ago. And Keith, who's now retired, was at my wedding, an amazing chap and an amazing mentor. So, you know, there are some fantastic people out there to learn from. And, and Archie and Keith were, were just two of those. And I'm privileged that I'm still in touch with both of them. And also all because you did take a massive risk. I mean, I really hope people do still do stunts like that because could you imagine on your rainy Wednesday if someone turned up, if a handsome guy turned up with a box of milk tray right now, you wouldn't complain, would you? So <laughs> I think I'd, sna I'd snatch the chocolates and chuck them out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great idea. And also I was thinking it's, it's, it's like the original influencer going about that but the network that that created for you I think the fact that you were bold and then also you've had these what we now call male allies you could say is that these senior men in business liked what you were about and also took that chance with you so what happened next with the magazines can you take us through planning one of those magazines and the process uh well again I don't do the work I just go get the work but it really, it's understanding from a client. And we still actually do some print now. It's probably only about 10 or 15% of our revenue, but we do still do some now. It's really understanding from the, they were called marketing directors in my day, but now they're called chief marketing officers, um, what they want their consumers to think about them and what they want in that feeling and that emotion about the brand for the customer to do. Is it to be loyal? Is it to join a, a club, to become a member, to buy a product? And then it's designing the magazine from a tone of voice, from a, a written long form copy, and also from a, an identity, a design identity point of view to reflect the personality of the business into the consumer's world by presenting the products and services of that brand in, in long form content and rewarding the relationship, thanking the customer for their business by giving them something tangible and physical, a magazine. And while magazines decline, have been declining, as has all print, um, over about 3% a year over the last probably 10, 15 years, actually in COVID, or after COVID, I should say, print had a bit of a resurgence because a lot of luxury brands are rewarding their customers with with beautiful magazines. Harrods, for instance, still does. Uh, one of our old customers still does a magazine today, Selfridges launched one this year, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's all about understanding. I think that unique relationship between the editor of the magazine and the consumer. So that a real, think about it, you know, you're on your sand lounger or you're on the train commuting for those of us that still have to come into London. And, you know, you've got a magazine that you're genuinely kicking back. You might have a cup of tea like I've got now. And, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're genuinely relaxing into a, a good read. And that relationship uh, isn't the same, I think, as, as social media. It's, you've got much more time in long form written content, whether that's a blog online or, or a, a physical paper magazine than you do with social media, where if you haven't caught someone's attention in a couple of seconds, you're just lost in the social media noise. So social media is, is a bit more difficult than form content because you've got less, you can't get it wrong. You've got less time to communicate, but it's a very talented group of editors and designers who who put these things together, same for social media, you know, whether it's motion graphics or video or whatever it is, you know, really getting into the head of understanding the brand first and foremost and what it is that they want to stand for in, from a values and purpose point of view, but also what they're selling and communicating and then how that should look and sound, you know, physically, whether that's on a on a screen or in paper is, is really important. And also interjecting into the customer's world, you know, people aren't stupid and they don't have time. Everybody's super busy. So if you don't engage with someone in their headspace, something that's important to them, then your messages lost that's why it's much more difficult for brands I think to get cut through these days yeah it's, it's very interesting because you think I was thinking oh I'm trying to remember how you'd measure success with a magazine because now it's about a like button which obviously is probably not as meaningful as a distribution of magazines but like you say having the right design team who've interpreted the brief and the customer and the end consumer is an absolute art form, isn't it? Because as you were talking about getting your magazine and in London, I love certain magazines. You just know that they're the right magazine for that moment, isn't it? If it's a, if you're going on holiday and just really wanting to pick up Elle magazine or something, they've all, they stand for a lot, don't they? And like you say, that consistency and that relationship between editor and reader 
is quite personal to each reader, isn't it? I think that's true. And, and you know, the same with social media. I mean, you know, video is such, or moving image is such a powerful medium. I mean, if I think about my kids, you know, they've got their phone, they've got their laptop most often, and the TV song. <laughs> There's all this stuff. And they're having a one word sometimes conversation at the same time, you know. There's so much going on. You really have to have, you have to be recognisable and you have to have something to say as a brand to really get that cut through. It sounds as though you've got a real, really great vision and way to react to the market. I'm wondering over the years of running the river business, how you've managed to spot trends and how you've responded to it. Like you said about the publishing trend was going down. Have there been some examples when you knew to jump on a trend or has it been challenging at times as well? God, yeah, it's been really challenging, particularly at the moment, actually. I mean, we had, I said earlier, we had a really good COVID, but who would have thought, you know, Brexit, then COVID, then the Ukrainian war, desperately sad. It's been a whole year now, right? But, you know, oh, terrible, terrible for them. But for the rest of us and for brands and businesses, distribution problems, the price of things going up. Now we've got the economic crisis. It's, you know, for those businesses that did survive the pandemic, that's why lots of retailers are really struggling now because they can't get products and why so many are going out of business. But I think in regard to, to trends, my dad said something to me, my, sadly, my dad now, he died when I was 16, a long time ago. Love you, dad. He always said to me that the secret of success in anything, but particularly in business, was to just keep going. You know, you have a terrible experience, you, uh, you get the sack from a client, you don't win a pitch, whatever it is, but the next day you win something, you have a great experience, you get some brilliant feedback. But I, I also think that our long relationships with clients have really helped us out because of they, as they have, as businesses needed to change to respond to new technology or to the wants and needs of consumers, we necessarily, as, as a group of communications businesses, have had to change. We've had to go, okay, magazines are sadly declining, but, you know, all of those same skills with editors and designers and journalists can be, you know, transformative for social media. And that's why, like I said, we've got TV studio now we've got a podcast studio uh, we just won a, an award for our boots podcast yesterday thank you the european content awards and the same for Superdrug too well done to boots and Superdrug for working with us we really are very good um but i think working with clients for a long time means that the team and myself too as a strategist you know you get to know the brands and businesses you get to know what they want and need you get to know what their consumers want and need because really we're creating a conversation between the brand and the consumer and therefore necessarily as a business you have to change you have to do things differently you have to learn new skills I mean we learned lots of new skills over COVID and we were about 50 50 print and digital going into COVID we're now 90 percent digital and 10 percent print uh, if you don't change then you become redundant and we certainly don't want to become redundant so every day's a school day Hannah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And again, I, I've got a feeling I'm going to say congratulations a lot through this phone call because the awards, the podcast awards, how great. Brilliant. You talked about you had a lot to learn and you learned lots in COVID. What does that mean tangibly for the business? Is that upskilling your your teams or is it hiring new people or a bit of both? Both, both yeah. Absolutely. I talked about Phil and Wendy, the, the first two people that the business employed all those years ago, you know, my great friends and colleagues now, you know, they're both print people, you know, Phil, God love him, even though he looks like Peter Pan, is in his 60s, Wendy's a similar age to me and her mid mid to late 50s you know we the, things aren't the same as they were you know I look at my kids I remember the first mobile phone Hannah you know it looked like a car battery yeah, I mean you won't because you're younger but it looked like a car battery with a big old a quite sexy actually like Gucci strap type thing and you used to cart it around with you in the pub and because hardly and it had a proper telephone like an old style telephone thing on it you know think, things change and you you have to change you have to stay relevant otherwise you're invisible and how does that work with you mentally? Because it makes a lot of sense, but that's carrying quite a lot on your shoulders. For yourself and for the other business founders, you could easily never sleep or never stop as the world changes so much. Is there any, what, how have you managed to cope with um, an ever-changing world and all of the headwinds that you mentioned earlier as well? I think you just have to, you just have to keep going. Thanks, Dad. I think my therapist would, Saskia, thanks, Saskia, would say that, you know, I created the family I didn't have. The people that work 
that I work with are really important to me and I would like to think it's a reciprocal thing. And so you will get, you will change and then get through it together. And I would class, you know, my clients in a similar vein in terms of mental well-being. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It is tough because it's a responsibility. Sometimes you don't want to get up and come in. You know, there are other people that run these businesses. Do I necessarily need to be here? But as in agency world, clients often want to see the person that they perceive to be in charge. And sometimes that person is me. So you have to. Actually, I, I spoke earlier about getting remarried a few years ago now. And Danny's got a very big family. I don't, sadly. And he had 60 family there. And I had 60 clients because though these are people that I've spent, yeah, Holland and Merritt, 27 years, super drug. 20 years I've spent a lot of my time and life with and that you know as their careers have improved as they've moved businesses I'm fortunate that they've taken me and the, and the agencies with them and and I thank them for that but I suppose long answer to a short question what I'm saying is that you've got a support network all around you and also you know at the end of the day it's only business you know what's more important is my kids best projects so I've I, you know, I've ever started and will never conclude because they will outlast me. And yeah. and it never was it thus. But, you know, it's work. Uh, it's enjoyable, but it's work. It's not life. Mm. Life is so much more, which is why I do loads of other things outside of the agencies. And I would encourage others to do the same because everything can't go well all the time. So you need lots of interests, I think, so that you can get your uh, mental stimulation or your approbation from somewhere. If it's not, you know, if you're only doing one thing and there's a problem in that one thing, then everything looks terrible. If you're doing 10 things and there's a problem in one thing, then it feels less impactful. Very good advice. And the art behind you has reminded me that I read that you loved dogs and also that I remember you'd studied art. So if we can move into the what you do outside of work, because I believe it's quite a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I collect art and I actually, my aspiration when I don't do agencies anymore, so I'm going to be 60 in 2024, my plan is to open a gallery. I'd like to make art less snobby, sorry for all you art people watching, and more available uh, and understood by all. So that's my plan. I'm going to have a gallery in the metaverse, but I'd also like to have a physical gallery, hopefully in Venice, because I'm a bit of a water person. Uh, what else do I do? I am a trustee of the Katie Piper Foundation. I've done that for nine years and I've done lots of charities over the years. For about 30 years, I've been involved in charities in China, but also in the UK. I'm also chair of the board of trustees of the Sophie Hayes Foundation, which is something as the mum of six kids, four of them girls, is very important to me. Um, it's about sex trafficking, which is largely of women and girls. We support the survivors of modern slavery and sex trafficking in, into um, employment. And that's what that charity does. I've been doing that for just under a year. Fantastic. We do a lot of work with the UN, with the Salvation Army. So that's amazing. I've got a couple of other businesses. One is a, an HMO, a kind of posh property. So I'm a landlord. Hello there to my tenants. So I've got a number of, well, I've got a building company. And then most recently, another pandemic set up like Reflect. Um, I set up a skincare and vitamin business with a great friend of mine, Lisa Hardy, who is the managing director of Hotel Chocolat, actually. Hello, Lisa, if you're watching. But she used to be, about 10 years ago, the chief marketing officer of Holland and Barrett, who we have worked with for 27 years. And that's where I met her. So we set up B&B, there it is, um, which is all about the gut, brain, skin axis, the microbiome. So the relationship between how you look and what you eat and, to your point earlier, your mental well-being. She is obviously an expert in vitamins, having worked at Holland and Barrett. And I'm horribly vain, so I'm really interested in skincare. So we came together and worked with a, a leading UK nutritionist to set up Beauty and Vitality, which is now available in Superdrug, but also on our website. And we have two products. We have one for menopausal women, because we're both menopausal. And we also have one for young women in their late teens and 20s who still suffer with breast breakouts because she's got four kids one of whom is a daughter in that age range and I've got six kids four of whom are daughters in that age range so we've kind of created the ideal product for ourselves and we're just hoping that other people buy it so so yeah those are some of the things that I do when I'm not 
here in marble art. It's very varied, isn't it? Is this something that you think when you've had success in your career that you can afford to do these things? Is that for, and you've got the contacts to help you launch your own skincare brand? Or is this something that you could have equally done at the beginning of your career? Yeah, I think anyone can do anything. I think, I, I mean, it, it's, you know, I sound like a self-help book now. And my friend Katie's written a lot of those. I think anyone can do anything they want to do. But I definitely think that having contacts helps. But so does having the courage of your own convictions and confidence. And even when things go wrong, I think finding another way into it. I mean, if you think about Peter Jones on Dragon's Den, you know, he's had a number of businesses that have failed. He ended up moving back in with his mum and dad when his first nightclub business failed. You know, more recently, Jessa, um, which was a river client, actually, how come I know, also failed. But he's got other businesses that are successful. And it's a bit like I said about, you know, when you asked about mental well-being. If you've got more than one thing that you do, then you can get your pleasure and your approbation in another way, even if something isn't working. And I think understanding what works and what doesn't work in different industries. I remember doing my um, MBA in marketing and what was really interesting about it was it was part thesis, but part residential. So once a weekend, once a month, sorry, you would go, we would go for a weekend at the Chartered Institute of Marketing and there were 25 of us. And I remember that, you know, walking into the room, it was mostly men. Uh, there were a few women, but not many. And they, But they were from the most amazing businesses, whether it was manufacturing or retail or FMCG or whatever it was. And just understanding from other people the problems or the challenges that their businesses had faced and how they had solved them was applicable to my then fledgling business because that was when I first set up River in 1994. And I, I, so what I'm saying, I guess, is that you can learn, you can learn from your own experience, but more than that, you can learn from the experience of other people. And, you know, like Archie Norman, like Keith Gold, like the many women, Barbara Ann King, so the chairman of Investec, an amazing, amazing businesswoman, Ali Crossley, managing director of legal in general, who I'm privileged to call an ex-client, but a very, very good friend. You know, learning from these people and asking their advice is, mm. you know, it's, it's a great privilege, but it's also brilliant because they'll be going, I'll be going, oh, this has happened and can you believe it? And oh, bloody hell. And somebody will say, yeah, but Nikki, come on. You can't have an argument on your own, can you? So what about this perspective? And you and you then think, oh, yeah, actually, that's correct. Or mm-hmm. I don't agree, but it's an interesting perspective. So I think drawing a network of people around you that you respect, admire, and who are going to tell you the truth, not what you want to hear, is really important. And, and I'm privileged to have lots of business contacts, whether they're clients or or, or ex-clients or, you know, now friends who who aren't frightened to say, cut the bullshit, this is the way you should really do it. It takes being proactive, however, doesn't it? It does mean keeping in touch with a broad network of people and you've obviously built and maintained relationships over the years. So I think that's a really strong takeaway because as we get to 40s and 50s, we've actually worked with a lot of different people, but it really is on us to keep in contact with them isn't it? And uh, I recently, both of us know uh, Dan Jarvis as an example, and I recently reached out to him to tell, to remind him and thank him of a time when he helped my salary, he reviewed my salary and said that I wasn't in line with my male counterparts. And I'd been telling this story years later and said, I'm going to say to him, I just want to tell you that made a massive impression on me. And he said, I'm still really passionate about it creating transparency. Uh, and I think your message is to get that advice and give it back and keep in touch with this network, I think. A hundred percent. And you talked about male allies and work with Danford, God, all the time he's been at Superdrug. And I think he's been at Superdrug almost as long as I've worked with Superdrug. So yeah, he's fantastic. You know, dad of two girls, you know, lovely wife who also used, Helen, who also used to work at Superdrug. I think having male and female allies is really important, but also helping people. I do think there is a breed of, of men and women, but unfortunately, you know, women who want to be the only woman in the room, the only woman at the boardroom table, and therefore helping other women isn't first on their agenda. And I'm very much not like that. As far as I'm concerned, I would love to surround myself with more successful women and to see more women be successful, particularly as the mum of of four girls in their 20s you know it's really important to me and if I look around here I'm I'm in Hyde Park today and all the agencies are in in the same building in Marble Arch you know we're about 75% women 
that's not to say that my male colleagues aren't fantastic. They are. But it's very important, I think, to empower and help when you can. Um, and, and that's very much an ethos of my businesses. I was going to say, is there any way that you can influence that? You can't really understand necessarily how some women would just want the space to themselves, but maybe it's been hard, hard fought for, and that could be why. Is there anything from a business owner's perspective or someone so high up in media that you think could be what people could do to, to stop that kind of behaviour? I think it is changing, you know, just like diversity and inclusion is becoming much more to the fore. And I hope it isn't a trend. I hope it sticks. I also think that, you know, recognising women, you know, there are more chief executives than ever who are females. It's still only 13%. I do think things are changing. And I think media and marketing is a good example of an industry that that is probably more female than male. So all I would say to anyone is don't discount anybody. Just because somebody left the workforce and had a baby doesn't mean they don't have the same skills and qualifications that they previously had. It's just like taking a sabbatical, except it's knackering, um, you know, <laughs> for six months or a year or however long that person has been out of the workforce. I think giving people a chance and employing for attitude, not for ability all the time is, you know, is really, really important because work should be as far as is possible enjoyable and therefore you want to surround yourself with people that uh, have got the same values and attitude as you you know you don't just get married to anybody do you you get married to somebody that you have the same values as that you just happen to fall in love with and I think choosing colleagues is is the same really it's people that can do the job of course it is because otherwise they can't have a seat at the table but it's also people that that, you know, that like working with you and that you like working with. And in agency world, the clients like working with, because that's obviously important because they pay the mortgage. Brilliant. Attitude over ability or attitude and ability, but how to create really energetic, happy teams. The best work comes out of teams that are happy where they work. So I think that's a really good message. I can't believe you've managed to have so many children. I almost kept thinking I misheard it. Have you got <laughs> six? <laughs> yeah, blend, blended family. So I actually only gave birth to two of them. But when I remarried, so, so I'm on my, the second Mr. Murphy. Hello, Danny. No, the only. He, Danny had four kids and three of them lived with him. So and when we got married, we didn't live together before. He moved into my house because it, it ha just happened to be a little bit bigger. And then we went into lockdown. So my husband and I spent lockdown three years with five yeah young adults so the food and booze bills were particularly high so we went through a real growth phase as a family that I feel you know as a stepmom to four I feel really privileged to have had that time because you know there were a lot of there were a lot of fights but there were also a lot of really fantastic times and I think therefore that my children and Danny's children are very close. When we go out, everybody thinks they, they don't look dissimilar either. It's a bit like living in Love Island, which can be a bit depressing when you're my age. But, you know, they are they look very similar. They have the same attitudes. They're all great go getting young adults and and they really do feel like, a, you know, we do feel like a, just one family, which is which is fantastic. Another huge achievement. I mean, it was make or break going into lockdown with that many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our best weekend was we turned when we turned every room into in the house into a pub. That was one that won't be forgotten for a long while, I don't think. But anyway, yeah, it might might not have been remembered the next morning. But now, now there's some memories. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I, I'm going to wrap up with a question I like. I ask everybody, but you've given so many tips throughout this whole conversation, is in our 40s, things can go in different directions. Sometimes it's time for a change. Sometimes it's time for a rebirth. I was wondering if you were to, if one of your friends who is getting to this period of life where they're feel, feeling a bit stagnant, they haven't got their fire, they're not really feeling that strength. What kind of advice or guidance you would give based on yeah, your experience? I mean, I think something, well, I got divorced in my 40s. I, I think two things. I would, the, the best advice I've ever been given, and I've already mentioned it, was my dad. You know, just keep going. I have a, I own a PR agency. You know, today's bad news is tomorrow's chip paper, and it is true. But also, I think, for me, 
going into therapy um, briefly in my early 50s was absolutely transformative. So under spending a bit of time with myself uh, and understanding why I am the way I am, good and bad, was scary and fascinating at the same time. And it has truly, I can say, changed my life and my attitude to life. And I would also say, read The Secret. It is American. It is a tiny bit happy clappy. And I think it was only the third time I read it that it actually spoke to me. But believing that you can manifest your very best life by thinking differently, it worked for me. And I would advocate, I mentor quite a lot of people. And, and that's one of the things I say to everyone, you know, bear with, but read it. And even if it doesn't speak to you now, you know, believing that you can do and be whatever you want by tapping into the universe, asking people for help and giving back and being grateful for what you've got. It, it totally worked for me. It changed my life. So your complete evidence of manifesting a brilliant life, a great business, awesome family. And also, like you say, long running clients who have become like friends and family as well as the good causes as well. So I knew I was going to get so much from this conversation. So thank you so much for sharing your story, your insights, your wisdom, and so much more with us in the audience. We wish you all the best and we hope to see you in Venice. <laughs> Well, thank you, Hannah. I don't think I've ever been called wise. So that's going to be my word of the day. Thank very you very good. much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I, I'm not at all jealous that you're in Bali and I'm in London and it's raining, just saying. <laughs> I've, I've got to have something on you. I've got to have something. <laughs> <laughs> take care. You, you take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.